Fitch's paradox of knowability is a famous paradox in the logic of knowledge. But I'm going to argue here that it's actually an argument for the existence of God in disguise. So let's get started with some of the background. Um, the sort of Copernican revolution in philosophy, we'll say it began with uh, John Locke. Uh, John Locke wrote this essay concerning human understanding, where he advocated empiricism. He said there is nothing in the intellect that isn't first in the senses. It's the same stance that Aristotle took, and Plato did not take. And he had this view that the mind starts out almost like a blank slate, called the tabula rasa. So it starts out with nothing on it, and it's experience that forms all of our ideas. So we start with the sense experience. Memory then is decayed sense experience, and then it continues with further reflection and further building stuff up in the mind. In fact, his entire first book was an argument against any sort of innate ideas or any innate structures in the mind. He believed that we start with sense experience, and then knowledge continues then with processing that sense experience. David Hume then wrote an inquiry concerning human understanding almost as a response to John Locke. He agreed with Locke that there's nothing in the intellect that isn't first in the senses. But he also argued that, given this fact, most of our knowledge, what we call knowledge, isn't knowledge at all. Most of what we think we know uh, does not derive in sense experience and cannot possibly derive from sense experience. For example, I have this sensation of sitting in a room right now uh, looking at a computer monitor. I have no way of proving or even perceiving that I am not in, say, the matrix or in some sort of dreamlike state or even that my experiences, the thoughts sort of going on in my head, are being caused by anything else. If external objects were perceived directly, then it would be impossible to argue that one could be in the matrix. We could perceive directly that these external material objects exist, and therefore we are not in the matrix. So that's something you cannot prove through sense experience. The second is called inductive reasoning, where you start with particular experiences and build up general rules, like the entire enterprise of science works this way. Start with particular experiments, control your variables, and then say, okay, because of this experience, therefore there are these general laws. But induction requires access not only to what is the case, but what would be the case, counterfactuals. Uh, Hume says that cause, for example, is not just that there's one, uh, one billiard ball moves up to another, stops, and the second billiard ball moves forward. We have to know that were it not for the first billiard ball hitting it, the second billiard ball wouldn't have, have gone forward. And so that's the idea of cause, what would have been the case. But what would have been the case is simply never perceived by sense experience. Uh, nothing in metaphysics is perceived in the senses. That's actually what differentiates metaphysics from other fields. In metaphysics, uh, we're dealing with things like, uh, am I just my brain, or am I a soul? Is there a material world? Is time sort of like space where it's all spread out, and there's no objective now? Do objects have parts, or, is, or are there just fundamental particles arranged, let's say, chair-wise, or door-wise, or person-wise? None of these can be experimentally demonstrated, and none of these are really in the senses. Uh, and also ethics. There's nothing about what someone should do that can be based in the senses. We can at least see what things are happening or what things are appearing to us, but again, ethics is not anchored in sense experience. And in fact, sense experience, purely in and of itself, is never really going to get us beyond solipsism, the idea that... Um, all of reality is my own sense perceptions. At least you can't disprove that with sense experience, since the only thing you have access to is sense experience, and your sense experience would at least appear the same in the world where solipsism is true and in the world where there's actually material stuff going on. So, Immanuel Kant uh, wrote in a response to Hume saying, look, we need these kind of pre-existing ideas, such as space and time, and cause in order to, to do our physics. So he said, how can I create the synthesis between the arguments of, of Locke and the arguments of Hume? And he said, okay, the mind structure has pre-existing categories. It's not so much that uh, 
the slate has stuff on it, the slate's still blank, but it's more like, let's say, something made of marble. When you try to, to chisel marble, marble has veins in it, which means it's not going to be chiseled any old way. There are limited structures, limited ways that you can chisel marble. Another way of thinking of it is like a black and white camera. If you have a low resolution black and white camera, you can be guaranteed ahead of time nothing you shoot will ever be in color. And he said the mind is sort of like that. It limits what is possible to be experienced. And those limitations on our possible experience are the a priori, the sort of before sense experience view. Now, the problem as he admits with this is we are uh, giving up on having this a priori knowledge of the world in itself. Instead, we're trying to get to what's called the phenomenal world, which is the world as as we experience it. So we can say that doors exist and chairs exist um, and that the world divides itself that way because our minds cut the world in certain ways. And so we cannot speak meaningfully of the world in and of itself, but we have to experience the world as it appears to us. And he's one of the first anti-realists, and that's his view called anti-realism. So on anti-realism, truth is not out there waiting to be discovered. Instead, it's our minds that, that shape and structure reality and meaning in terms of itself. So we, can define, we have to define truth on anti-realism in terms of what we are capable of knowing, and therefore all truths are knowable by definition. There's also several flavors of anti-realism. One is called global anti-realism, which is, that, like Immanuel Kant's view, is a type of global anti-realism. Everything we experience, everything that's true, is still, in some sense, anchored in our ability to know things. So truth is anchored in us, at least partially. Whereas a limited anti-realist will say, um, let's say like Dr. Craig, William Lane Craig, is an anti-realist regarding abstract objects. That there really aren't any abstract objects, but we can still talk as, as though there were. Uh, there's also this, thing, uh, this distinction between existential and subjective anti-realism. Uh, existential anti-realism says there's no facts of the matter at all. Again, like a nominalist, Dr. Craig, for example, will say there are no facts of the matter about um, numbers as existing beings because there are no existing beings that we call numbers. Uh, an anti-realist about ethics will say that there's no fact of the matter about what is objectively right or wrong. Well, a subjective anti-realist, and Kant was a subjective anti-realist, would say, there are facts of the matter, but they owe their truth value to our mind's activity. So our mind shapes reality, or maybe like a butcher carves up reality, but it, it, the mind creates the joints at which you carve reality. And so that's yeah, that's Kant's view. And so Fitch's paradox, and I put that in quotes here, emerged from a paper by Frederick Fitch, which he wrote on his theory of value. And he had this formula that said, if I take propositional logic, like P can be a proposition, it's raining outside or something like that. An O can be like an operator. Uh, it's like an operator that you add to it. Like, um, like let's say O is insinuation. Uh, and P is like, uh, we'll say P, P is, my political opponent is a scoundrel. Like, I can insinuate the statement, my political opponent is a scoundrel, and I didn't just insinuate that my political opponent is a scoundrel. That itself isn't a paradox. Politicians do that all the time. But if O is, like, equal to truth, so it's true that my opponent is a scoundrel, and it's not the case my opponent is a scoundrel, okay, that's a contradiction. Uh, it's, it can't be true and false. So if, and, and there's certain operators that are stronger than truth. Knowledge uh, implies truth, or you've proven something that's stronger than truth because it implies truth. So if we get the claim that all truths are knowable, it can be shown that all truths are known in Fitch's paradox. Or more precisely, if any given truth is unknown, then the truth is unknowable. And it, and it goes something like this. This is sort of my axiomatization of Fitch's paradox. It's, it's a little bit simpler and it's less prone to criticism. So we take, with epistemic logic, K to be the operator, it is known that. We're going to take um, the diamond, means possible. So uh, if you see the law of non-contradiction, it, it, it's not possible, P and not P. So it's not possible for something to be both true and false. Uh, 
so that you'll see that in the lower left. Um, K, yeah, K is no ability. P will be just some proposition. So we take propositional logic, add the possibility operator, and we'll add the knowledge operator. So the left three are, are rules in epistemic logic. They are what we call metalogic rules. So the first rule is, if I know P and Q, two different propositions, it means that I know P and I know Q. So if I know it's raining outside and my car is wet, th therefore I know it's raining outside and I know my car is wet. KP implies P, or KP proves P means if something is known, then it's true. We've discussed the law of non-contradiction. And then we have the two dogmas of anti-realism. The first is that all truths are knowable for every P. P implies possibly KP, because that's the definition of anti-realism. And secondly, uh, there exists a truth that uh, is unknown. It's true and unknown. So not all truths are known, and that's also a dogma of anti-realists. And so the proof is simple. The proof basically just shows that if we accept all five of these, we generate a contradiction. And this is just you know, the proof through uh, propositional logic with the possibility uh, and um, knowledge operators. The first response is, okay, let's go for realism. Um, we don't need, uh, let's say that there are unknowable truths, right? We don't need to be an anti-realist. Anti-realism kind of sucks anyway. It's sort of like, you know, the character O'Brien in the novel 1984. The guy was trying to pass off truth as what the party says, as opposed to what really is the case. And so maybe we should be realists, like Winston was. Well, the problem here is that we don't actually have to be anti-realists for the knowability principle to hold. Because the knowability principle, in order to work, to generate the contradiction, just needs to be a very limited, just limited in scope, so that we find one instance of, and I'll show you the previous one, all right, one instance of possibly K, P, and not KP, so number three. We just need one instance of that. Anything that'll give us one instance of three is going to generate the paradox. And so let's limit our, our discourse of knowledge to um, D is the operator for decidable sentences of number theory. So there are sentences in number theory that, that you could prove or disprove within a system like Robinson or, say, Presper or Arithmetic, these decidable systems. And let's make KP um, someone has a proof of P. And so for every decidable sentence, possibly some you know, someone has a proof for it we'll, we'll use that and that certainly seems I mean, very plausible that's sort of what we mean by decidable anyway it's possible to prove it otherwise it wouldn't be decidable and there certainly are plenty of decidable statements that we don't seem to know yet and so Rasmussen basically wrote this basically wrote just what I said that um, KP is roughly we have a proof of P and he gives pretty much three ways of saying that, uh, or defining how someone has a proof of P. And he says KP is tantamount to having access to what's a recursively enumerable list of proofs. Uh, but on any of these readings of K, KP is just as decidable as P. So again, as we showed, like, if P is decidable, then P is possibly known. And KP itself is also decidable and possibly known which is also therefore decidable and possibly known ad infinitum by this definition. Now, all right, so realism is not actually going to fly here, it's, or it's not going to solve the problem. I think it's true. I certainly think anti-realism is, is a terrible view of knowledge. Um, but we can't get anti-realism, so just denying that possibly you know, all truths are knowable is not going to work because there clearly are scopes of truths which are no, all entirely knowable and so we get the paradox so the second one is we go for intuitionism now it when i gave this presentation before it's sort of hard for people to understand how would intuitionism get you out of the paradox as i showed a few slides earlier um and i guess the reason that intuitionism isn't so relevant for my paradox is that intuitionism says uh, if something is not not true you can't say it's therefore true so not not p doesn't imply p because intuitionism is based on some like um that math and logic are based on our intuitions and our intuitions which means we need to give direct proofs as opposed to indirect proofs 
uh, but nothing in my formula is incompatible with intuitionist logic. It is like this whole formula is not assuming anything that the intuitionist wouldn't grant. So intuitionism is also just not going to fly. And, and Quanvig, who has this book on the knowability paradox, I think, yeah, new, yeah, it's it's called the knowability paradox. Quanvig, he, it's an excellent book. Definitely recommend reading it. He says even under intuitionism, yeah, we can prove that an unknown truth implies that the truth is unknowable. So we have the same paradox, and we have the same lost distinction with intuitionism. The third is okay. Let's go for something called Cartesianism. So Cartesianism is a, a proposition where you add the knowledge operator, and it's still consistent. So uh, you see, Kwanvig says, Tennant gives three ways that a proposition P can be anti-Cartesian. For one, P might itself might be inconsistent. Uh, if not, then it may be the sort of proposition uh, Descartes considered, such as no thinking thing exists. You can't, I mean, it seems like it's possible that no thinking thing exists could be true, but no one would ever be able to know it. Because you have to think to know. So the propositions are consistent, but it's not consistent to say they're knowable. And so we're going to sort of scrub away those types of inferences in order to block the paradox P and not KP. Uh, the assumption that P is known is inconsistent because of the iteration of the knowledge operators required to make the, assum the uh, assumption. Um, the problem here is that, one, it's an extremely ad hoc move, a very contrived move. Like, if we remember in set theory, Georg Cantor gave this uh, idea of a set as a well-defined collection of things. And from his set theory, he came up with this hierarchy of infinite mathematics, how to crunch numbers with infinite sets. But the problem is, his whole set theory led to these paradoxes, like Russell's paradox, um, sets that aren't members, the set of all sets that aren't member of themselves, or the set of all ordinals, or the set of all cardinals, are all paradoxical statements. And so the response from set theorists was not to say, okay, let's say that naive set theory is true, but require that all sets be um, like Cartesian, or consistent, we'll manually just delete all the inconsistent sets. No, the idea was to say, okay, we have to redo set theory into axiomatic set theory as opposed to naive set theory. We have to create a set of axioms and try to build set theory that way. So we didn't ever, no one ever suggested the Cartesian solution for set theory. And that should give us pause to sort of think this probably isn't a good solution. Um, but even that isn't necessary since Roy Cook in one of his papers showed that the statement P is true and non-Cartesian is itself non-Cartesian. And so the very idea of using the Cartesianism to get out of Fitch's paradox will itself derive a contradiction. You need this distinction between uh, Cartesian principles and non-Cartesian principles, and you need to be able to know both, like what is and isn't Cartesian, um, without generating a uh, without generating reductio as Cook did. So Cartesianism pretty much uh, bites the uh, bites the dust right here. All right, so Quanvig, in his book, then suggested that quantification over intentional contexts is the way out of this. Now, an intentional context is different than the extensional contexts. And here's here's the distinction. Um, uh, imagine the sentence, um, Jenny is afraid of someone that she thinks is the boogeyman. But unbeknownst to Jenny, th what she thinks of as the boogeyman is actually her sister Karen. So the boogeyman equals her sister Karen. Then you, can you say Jenny is afraid of Karen? Well, in one sense, that's that's false. Maybe you know they have breakfast together because they're sisters, and Jenny just doesn't know that Karen is that shadowy, scary figure. Um, and Quanvig argues that Fitch's paradox commits the same kind of fallacy. And he says in the knowability paradox, substitutions occur in intentional contexts when we take an instance of an unknown truth and substitute it into the knowability claim, therefore deriving the claim that the unknown truth is knowable. In this step, the proof contains a mistake of illicitly substituting into an intentional context, or so I should argue. Just as when you say, Jenny's afraid of the boogeyman, the boogie she thinks the boogeyman is, or the boogeyman is Karen, therefore 
Jenny is afraid of Karen. You can't substitute the boogeyman and Karen one for another without changing its truth value. And that's what's mean, meant by um, illicit substitution in an intentional context. Um, and there's also, though, in intentional context, the difference between dedicto and dere. So a dedicto statement is where we say, like, necessarily there's something that's, that, that is A, or it is known that something is A, versus dere is concerning the thing. So I might say there's something that is essentially or necessarily A. Um, maybe the uh, pencil I'm holding is not is necessarily made of wood. Anything that isn't made of wood just wouldn't be the same pencil. So it's essential, you know, its essence is that it's made of A. Uh, or there's, there's something such that it's known that it's A. Or you can also say um, of the thing, uh, Karen is afraid of that shadowy object, whatever that, that shadowy object is. All right, now you're talking about the thing. Um, and that shadowy object happens, um, or sorry, Jenny's afraid of that shadowy object. That shadowy object turns out to be Karen. And then in that sense, Jenny is afraid of Karen, as long as we're talking about the objects and not about like the word. Uh, we're talking about the things themselves. And so DeRay statements, though, the interesting thing about statements DeRay is you can substitute one for another, uh, two identical terms, one for another, without changing the truth value. Because we're talking about things and not so much about words. So the um, context of the sentence isn't going to change as long as you're stipulating you're talking about that object itself. Um, Quine had this view, uh, this, this argument where he said, um, you could say you could say the number of planets uh, is is nine. Um, nine is, or yeah, the number of planets is nine. Nine is necessarily a um, is necessarily compo uh, Let's see, three five three. Yeah, nine is necessarily odd. Therefore, the number of planets is necessarily odd, uh, and that that seems um, ambiguous. Are you saying the number of the number the numbers of planets as things now stand is odd? necessarily odd, which is true. Um, nine is necessarily an odd number. It couldn't have been otherwise. Just what we mean by nine. But if you say the number of planets, and we're talking about planets now, is necessarily odd. No, it seems like it could have been even. I mean, we could have had, it could be eight. In fact, it's considered eight now. So maybe it, maybe it's not. So is this about numbers or about planets? Well, if it's about DeRay, if it's about the things, numbers, then the statement holds and substitutivity holds. And so Quantig's neo Russellian solution says that I think it's that quantifiers themselves are intentional, and therefore the things they designate can't always be substituted one for another. And he talks about, like, uh, if a guy buys all the beer on the shelf, and the guy says, um, if there had been m more beer on the shelf, the guy would have bought it, uh, substitutivity sometimes fails in that context. And I'm not sure what to make of this, because when we distinguish the dictum and deray, we use the operator to make that, disti that distinction. So if we go previously here, notice where the modal operator is. It's after the quantifier in, in KP. Um, and so the, the, this dogma of anti-realism is deray. It's not to dicta. We start with the thing, meaning the proposition. And then we add no ability to the thing, the proposition as, as a thing, as an object. Uh, as opposed to say a sentence, which can be interpreted ambiguously. Uh, so and so this is a deray statement, and so substitutivity holds. And if we remember Rasmussen in slide eleven, he said Fitch's theorem can be expressed if we limit ourselves to decidable statements of mathematics. So we interpret P as the decidable statement of mathematics, we, or a decidable statement. We interpret KP as someone has a proof of P. This is DeRay. We're talking first about the mathematical statement, and then we're talking about a proof of a mathematical statement, and this doesn't even seem to be um, intentional. I mean, this, this seems to be an extensional statement, just a statement of mathematics that doesn't have this ambiguity about Karen and Jenny and fear. This isn't about beliefs. This isn't about uh, even like possible... Well, it, it's not so much about beliefs. Um, it's about things. It's about this is like this is um, a proposition, and this proposition has the property, the object, the proposition has the property of being knowable. This is deray and not to dicto, so substitutivity is going to hold. Now, of course, there's the elephant in the room of saying, um, how is God even a solution to the problem? How is it 
that if we have an omniscient God, that this solves the issue. Doesn't the paradox just reappear as soon as we restrict, we restrict our discourse domain into finite creatures? Um, and Grand Priest pretty much says the same thing. Like, let's say there is this omniscient being that we'll call God, and there's this friend called Gabriel, and Gabriel doesn't know everything, but can ask God to get knowledge of potentially anything. Like, uh, but, you know, so to Gabriel, all truths are knowable, but they are not known, and therefore, uh, therefore Fitch's paradox has to fail. Quanvik's conclusion as well is that he says he doesn't even claim that his whole Neil Rosellian um, substitution and stuff um, is even good enough to give it even an answer. He just says it's basically the only acceptable view uh, because the alternative is basically to, to lose the distinction between knowable truths and known truths, and that's just too much to ask. And that's basically his problem with a the theistic solution. He's like, there is a distinction between these two, and even if God exists, we have to make this distinction. We lose the distinction between knowable truths and known truths, because on, on Fitch's paradox, if all truths were knowable, then all truths would be known, and this is just basically not acceptable. Um, so my response to the elephant is, I, Graham Priest has to prove that it's even possible for a being like Gabriel to exist. It certainly doesn't seem like... Uh, that's possible, and I'll explain that in a bit once we go into perfect being theology. I've argued that in order to have a logic of knowability, you've got to have an omniscient being. You've got to have this perfect being theology. And you can't have a logic without having such a being, without taking that being into account. Because we're talking about which propositions have the property of knowability. And Quanbeck is like... Okay, what if you build a logic of knowability that excludes such a being? Well, that's just, that's just question-begging. You, you can't do that, as I've been arguing. Now, in perfect being theology, uh, God is seen as the ultimate being. If we can uh, say, uh, it, if we could conceive, form a concept of being greater than God, then that would be God. Uh, again, conceive, form a coherent concept. So, incoherent concepts uh, would not, I mean, that wouldn't be God. It's got to be a coherent concept, the, the greatest coherent concept one, one could formulate. Uh, God's going to be at least that great. So, so, now we need to be open to the idea that maybe God is a necessary being. Maybe God is a strictly logically necessary being, such that God does not exist entails some sort of contradiction. And we can't dismiss any such proof like that as a paradox. We also have this distinction here between maximal excellence and maximal greatness. Be a being is maximally excellent if the being is omniscient, omnipotent, and omni-good, and maybe some other properties as well. A being is maximally great if that being is maximally excellent in every possible world. Then we can think of a possible world as maybe a way that reality could be or could have been. So maximally excellence is a being that happens to be omnipotent, omniscient, and omni-good, but a being that's maximally great is not just that, but it but couldn't have been otherwise. So Alvin Plantinga gives an argument that it's like metaphysically possible that a maximally great being exists. Um, therefore, if it's possible such a being exists in every possible world, um, and there and therefore if such a being exists in every possible world, then such a being exists. So this is sort of his version of the ontological argument. And the implications of this are pretty profound. Um, it radically changes which worlds are possible. If perfect being theology is true, for example, then maybe there's no possible world where, um, let's say, not, there's no species more advanced than rabbits and everything is in hellish pain all the time. That such worlds just are not possible. There, there are ways that, that, seem, that seem like you can form a coherent concept of them, but they're not ways that reality could be. And I think it's um, Brian Leftow and Alexander Proust who are working on building a, uh, a logic of modality of what could be the case based on objects and their causal powers. Uh, and they think of it a little bit as a weakness that it doesn't seem to um, conform to all of our intuitions about what could be the case. But given Fitch's paradox, maybe it does. Maybe, it, maybe it's the only way of scrubbing paradoxes. So, on perfect being theology, there is no distinction between sentence P being true, sentence P being true and knowable, and sentence P being true and known, because all truths are known in every possible world. There is no distinction between truth, knowability, and knowledge. There are no possibly unknown truths. And the problem with restricted domains is as soon as we're changing the domain, 
of discourse, we are changing the subject. As Quine said, to change the logic is to change the subject. And that is exactly what Quanvig and Priest and others have done with this. He said if we restrict um, knowledge, we're no longer talking about which propositions have the property of knowability. We're talking about who knows what. So now knowledge is um, at least a two-place predicate. It could be a three-place predicate if we add uh, time, KPMT, knowledge for, of a proposition for some person at a certain time. The problem with that is um, the essence of certain beings. Like you can ask, could this being, this pen or this thing, have been made of uranium? And I think most of us would say no. Any object made of uranium would be a different being. It would be a different object. And similarly, you could ask, could you have been a trillion times smarter than you are and still be the same individual? And I think the answer is obviously no. A being that's a trillion times smarter than you just wouldn't be you. It would be a different person, a different entity, a different being. And so complexity limits for any finite being what that being is capable of knowing. There might be propositions that take more you know, take more space than there is uh, fundamental particles in the universe and are, say, irreducible. There's no way of reducing them through higher order logics. Uh, but the solution to some puzzle is just so large it's impossible for any being to uh, perform or to think or to write down or anything like that. So, um, in such in such worlds, there could be decidable statements that are un, that are knowable. They have the property of knowability because there's there's some formula to solve it. But there's no being which you can say, "Ha! This finite being has the ability to solve all of these puzzles." Because you take any being uh, and you say, "Okay, this super smart being, let's say Gabriel." It still, in order to be finite, has to have certain limits to what the being is able to know, or able to do, or able to, to what it's able to sort of crunch. And so you take a being, uh, its knowledge or its ability to like crunch formulas and numbers will top out somewhere. So you just take um, a formula that's more complex and say, therefore, it's not knowable to this creature. Uh, so it, it limits, so complexity limits what is knowable to finite creatures. Um, and so now when we try to uh, plug these formulas into Fitch's paradox, we, we either get question-begging statements. Uh, for example, this one, we say something is unknown to everyone. Well, if God exists, that's not true. So now this is simply false on perfect being theology, and there's no paradox. So fine, we'll say, okay, not all things are known to some person, but now uh, the the M thing, the exists in M, there is a person in the first one, there exists a person in the second one. Do we know they're the same person? By this formulation, we don't. And so that is logically invalid. Uh, so let's try to repair it. All truths are knowable to all persons, and not all things are known to some person. Well, again, given the ontology of finite creatures, not all truths are knowable to all persons. Certainly not. I, there's formulas way too complex uh, for uh, finite beings like ourselves to possibly know without being a different being. And so this is obviously false. We can collapse the two dogmas so that now we have there is a person and there is a proposition such that um, the proposition is um, is possibly knowable. The the uh, unknown proposition is is possibly knowable in this sense. But now we've just asserted the paradox instead of proving it, and so we, one can just deny the uh, two dogmas collapse into each other. There's no reason to believe it, and so the argument um, is logically valid, but just it has no warrant for that proposition where we collapse the two dogmas. And so Fitch's paradox just doesn't hold as soon as we <coughs> as soon as we change our domain of discourse the way we have. And so, uh, in conclusion then, I'm going to say there's a parallel case to this called Arrow's Theorem, Arrow's Impossibility Theorem, where Arrow said if you take these three very modest conditions, um, no, of voting. Like, there's no dictator. There's no one person who's going to sway all the votes all the time. Uh, there's Pareto efficiency. So, if voters prefer, let's say, oh, let's say a tennis court uh, in their you know housing development, they prefer a tennis court to a bike lane. Then, um, the outcome should prefer the tennis court over the the bike lane. If everyone prefers the tennis court to the bike lane, then the group should prefer the tennis court to the bike lane. The independence of relevant alternatives, meaning if we have the tennis court preferred to the bike lane, uh, and let's say, you know, someone says, what if we have a pool there? Well, you know, you add that to the vote, people should still prefer the tennis court over the bike lane, uh, even if they want the pool more than both or less than both or whatever. Um, 
the fact that you add additional alternatives into your vote, it shouldn't change how you rate one option against another. If you prefer a tennis court to a bike lane, um, when a pool is also available, then you should still prefer a tennis court to a bike lane when the pool is not available, since it's an irrelevant alternative. But Arrow showed there's no way to get all these conditions in every voting situation. There's voting situations where in order to get Pareto efficiency and the independence of irrelevant alternatives, you will have to have a dictator. And that's a weird theorem, a difficult theorem, but it's not a paradox. And the way I formulated Fitch's paradox, I hope it'll be accepted in the same way that you have these formulas, these uh, three statements of logic, and the two dogmas of um, anti-realism, and say these cannot all be true. And we just accept and embrace that. And I think the best way out is perfect being theology. And so this is my pastoral takeaway. We'll be, I'll be in a, you know, Christian preacher mode for a minute here, because uh, you know, some of them really have a lot of uh, guts and gusto, and I'm very appreciative of different preachers. Okay, so Quantvik seems to think that we should hold at least to a methodological atheism when we address philosophical problems. Why? Why should we have this different ontology? Why should we try to make our logic like neutral regarding whether or not you believe in God? Who's to say that logic, science, history, other disciplines require perfect being theology in order to work at all? And so if we find arguments like this, we can't simply just walk away. If they're problematic for worldviews, like atheistic worldviews, but not problematic for, say, Christianity or monotheism or whatever, then we should invoke these as a polemic against, uh, let's say, atheism. Because after all, the atheists would be just as willing. Imagine if this paradox, right, was a paradox for perfect being theology, but not a paradox under uh, atheism. Atheists would be using this as an argument against theism and against religion. So I'd say the shoe is on the other foot now, so let's, um, you know, let's return the favor to them. Shalom Aleichem.